throughout our session and our time together today. Today we're talking about polar bears, where they live, and the impact that climate change has had on them, and our audience is fourth through eighth graders. Our partner on today's program is the Discovery Educator Network, where I work, and my name is Kyle Schutt. I'll be the moderator, and what that means is I get to answer all of your fantastic questions, and we do encourage you to submit questions to questions at pbears.org. That's one way you can email them. Or, if you're on the live chat area of the website where we're broadcasting, it's even quicker if you post those questions directly into the live chat feed. We'll be gathering those and answering those at the end of the session, so please go ahead and think of your good ones, and even some of the questions that might come up as we talk throughout the conversation today. In addition, if you are a part of the Edmodo community, Polar Bears International has on Edmodo, please feel free to join us there and post your comments and questions. So I mentioned a little bit about myself, uh, that I do work for the Discovery Educator Network, my name being Kyle Shutt. I'd like to go down the panel and have everyone else introduce themselves, tell them a little bit about your work and maybe where you're coming from. Myself, I come from Washington, D.C. area. My name is John Whiteman. I'm a student at the University of Wyoming, and I've been studying polar bears since 2008. Um, I've had a lot of adventures in the last couple of years going out to uh, learn everything I can about bears. I've had chances to fly around in helicopters, travel on an icebreaker, and have other adventures. My main focus when I study polar bears is their physiology. So really I ask questions about their nutrition and the different kinds of things that polar bears eat. Hi, I'm Cecilia Bitts. I'm a professor at University of Washington in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences. I work on climate and climate change, and I'm really interested in the role of sea ice in the climate system. I'm, uh, I work with climate models, and I have been to the field on a ship like John. Uh, and uh, in the climate models, I'm interested in trying to predict how sea ice will change with climate. Hi, my name is Eric DeWeaver, and I work for the U.S. government. I work in the National Science Foundation. And what we do in the National Science Foundation is we provide funding, we provide money and resources so that climate scientists uh, can do the work that they need to do to understand how the climate system works, how the climate system is changing over time, and what are the natural fluctuations that you'd expect in climate. Where climate, of course, means everything from uh, the frozen cold climates, like what we experience here, all the way to the tropical warm climates, uh, and everything in between. Fantastic, thank you. We'll be hearing a lot from these panelists, but to give you a little bit of perspective, we wanted to talk to you about why are we here and how are we here. Um, we flew into a town called Churchill, and Churchill is on the western shores of the Hudson Bay. You can see our little image here, way up in northern Canada. And it does take a little while to get here, but you can come to Churchill and visit and come see the polar bears. In fact, it's known as the polar bear capital of the world. And the, the town of Churchill is very nice. In fact, there's a post office uh, that we visited, some grocery stores, good shopping as well mm -hmm. <laughs> for all things polar bear. Uh, there's also, though, of course, as you can imagine, um, a decent sized population. There's about 900 people that live up here. And what's interesting is that that's roughly the same size uh, or the same amount uh, of polar bears that live in this area, in this region. So um, kind of puts things into perspective a little bit. Also, the uh, um, way in which that we can interact and come join with you is on tundra buggies. And what's a tundra buggy? Think about a school bus kind of crossed with a monster truck, if you will. <laughs> big tires, um, there's one that you're looking at right now, big tires and kind of a school bus on top of it. Um, and believe it or not, they're relatively warm. We have a, a heater in the back of it that keeps us warm. Um, but with the wind whipping around, it just can't always keep you warm enough. So luckily we, we kind of adapt by wearing these nice thick jackets and try to stay as warm as possible. John here is our expert on polar bears, and so what we're going to start off the program by doing is him talking about this environment that the polar bears live in, and he has a whole lot of great stuff for you. So, John, go ahead. Sure thing. So the first thing to notice about polar bears is that they're really big. Um, as you can tell by some of the pictures of polar bears we've shown already today, and you can tell by the replication of the skull that I have sitting here in front of me. This is a replication of what a real polar bear skull looks like, and this is the actual size, so that's how big it is. 
Um, when polar bears are born, on the other hand, they're tiny. They're only 600, maybe 700 grams, so that's going to be about a pound or a pound and a half. That's really little. But they grow really fast, and by the time they uh, grow up to be adults, they're huge. Now, they're a very dimorphic species. That means that males and females are very different sizes. So they're born at the same size, but by the time a female grows up, she'll weigh around 300 kilograms or so, which is about 650 pounds. A male will be around 500 kilograms, which is going to be around 1,100 pounds. Now, the biggest polar bears we suspect can weigh up to 800 kilograms, which is going to be 1,800 pounds, which is going to be 12 of me. Um, but we don't actually know for sure uh, exactly how big the biggest polar bears get because we just don't have the equipment that can weigh them. They're actually too big for scientists to be able to weigh. Now polar bears are just one of eight different species of bears and they're most closely related to brown bears which are also called grizzly bears. Now unlike brown bears of course polar bears are all white which helps them blend in with all the snow and ice in their environment which is the kind of snow and ice that you're seeing around here. The other unique things about polar bears um, include the shape of their teeth. And the first thing about that is if you notice their canine teeth, which are those things that you'd see on the front of the teeth, on the front of the jaw, um, which are the fangs, as you can see there in the picture. Now those are very large, and that's because they need these teeth to be able to hold on to slippery seals, which are their favorite prey. The second thing about the teeth is that if you look at the cheek teeth back here on you and me, and also, I don't know if we can, I'll lift it up a little bit so we can see here. Whoops, so I don't drop it. That'd be these teeth right down in here, these cheek teeth, are going to be very small on a polar bear. They aren't going to be nearly as big as they are on a brown bear. And the reason for that is because brown bears will eat a lot of vegetation, and so they need those cheek teeth in order to uh, grind tough grass and that kind of thing. Because brown bears do eat meat and they eat other animals, but they also eat a lot of vegetation. In contrast, polar bears really don't. They primarily eat seals, and so as a result, they don't have to do as much chewing. So perhaps the most important thing about polar bears, really, is that they eat seals. That's how they make their living. They go out onto sea ice, which we'll talk about in just a second, and they eat seals. And I want to demonstrate, as long as we have a skull here, just real quick, what that might look like. So what do you have in store for us here, John? I'm interested to see. So we have our, uh, we have our wonderful moderator here next to me, a guy named Kyle. And you can pretend that we have a polar bear coming along here. It's going to open its mouth, uh -oh. and it's going to come right down oh, on top of his head like that. And if Kyle were a seal, he would be making a polar bear very happy right now. You know, that's interesting, because we had a question that I just saw. Uh, what's the bite force of a fully grown polar bear? Do you have any idea of that? Oh, that is a fantastic question. Um, off the top of my head, I cannot remember. But I do know that it's been measured, and it's actually very similar to that of brown bears. What's interesting is that even though the bite force is similar between polar bears and brown bears, the skulls are shaped slightly differently. And so that force is distributed across the skull in a different way. And believe it or not, it's actually less efficiently distributed around <coughs> the polar bear skull. So that means that polar bear skulls are not very good at biting down with a lot of force. Now that seems like a little unusual because they're hunting seals all the time. But the thing is, a seal is actually kind of a soft prey item to bite. They have a lot of fat on them and it's mostly soft tissue. And so polar bears bite down on the seal and it's pretty soft. In contrast, brown bears are actually chewing on a lot of vegetation, which is really tough. So they're really grinding their teeth a lot. And so that's the, the difference in how the, the stress of the bite force is distributed. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, I, I think what we'd also like to talk a little bit about um, is this climate. And Eric, um, being, uh, having a, a focus and a specialty on climate, can you talk to us about the, the dynamic environment that these polar bears live in? Sure. Um, let's start with thinking a little bit about the climate where we are right now near Churchill. Um, if you just look out the window, you can sort of see that what we are on right now is tundra. It's a very flat surface. Uh, there's not a lot of vegetation on it. The vegetation that is on it is very low to the ground and stunted. It's very different from where I live near Washington, D.C., where you can have big trees that are very leafy and very tall. Um, now, you wouldn't know it today because everything is kind of cold. The ice-covered season is just about to get started. But in the, in the summertime, it can get really warm here. It can be as hot as 90 degrees Fahrenheit. 
in the winter it can go down all the way to 40 degrees below zero. So that's a really big temperature range here and only really hardy vegetation can survive in the cold, cold winters. Um, but if you really want to think about what climate means to polar bears, you have to think about where the polar bear is and what it looks like through the eyes of a polar bear because they're not going to be here all year long. They're just going to be here in the time of the year when Hudson Bay is free of ice. Now, one thing that always confuses me is when you think about Hudson Bay, I think of a bay as a not very big place, you know, maybe just a little piece of shore with a little town in it or something like that. Hudson Bay is enormous. Hudson Bay is half the size of the Mediterranean Sea. It's almost a half a million square miles um, in its area. And what happens in the wintertime is that whole big bay freezes over. And that's what polar bears depend on. You know, I mentioned that the ecosystem of tundra is dependent on having the climatic conditions of tundra. But for polar bears, it's, it's actually a much more direct relationship between the climate and the habitat and the ecosystem of the bear because it's only the cold temperatures that allow the ice to form on the bay and cover the bay completely so that the bear can walk around on that bay, hunt for seals on that bay, do all the activities that it needs to do uh, all of those activities are dependent on the fact that that whole vast expanse of Hudson Bay freezes over in the wintertime. Interesting. So we're talking, especially today, our whole uh, title is Polar Bears in a, warming, in a Warming World. Can you talk to us about climate change and wh what are the basics to understand what this means? Well, I guess the starting point for thinking about this and the way people started thinking about it, say, in the early 1800s, is if you want to understand... Uh, how warm the Earth gets, you have to understand two things. You have to understand how the planet receives energy, and you have to understand how the planet gives off energy to cool itself down again. So we know that the planet receives energy from the sun. It's the same as when you go outside, you feel the sun on your face and it warms you. It's warming the whole planet. And the question then becomes, well, if the if this Earth is constantly being warmed by the sun, then how does the Earth then cool off so that it can maintain a steady temperature? And the way it does that is by giving off infrared radiation to space. And that's tricky because you can't see infrared radiation. You're not directly sensing that going on, but it's going on all the time. And one of the things that determines how much infrared radiation the planet can give off and how easily the planet can cool itself is the, 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 the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And it's this concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that we talk about when we talk about global warming. So Since if I can interrupt, you're yeah. talking about greenhouse gases. I've heard about the greenhouse effect. Um, what you mean is just that idea of trapping heat like a greenhouse does? That's right. You could, you could take a greenhouse and you could put it out on the tundra today. And as long as that greenhouse is covered over, a person standing inside the greenhouse will be much warmer than a person standing right next to the greenhouse outside the greenhouse, even though the two people are feeling the same warming effect of sunlight because the greenhouse dome is transparent. Okay. So it's that heat trapping effect that we're talking about. We're talking about uh, gr the greenhouse effect. Um, the problem that comes up and what we talk about as global warming is the fact that greenhouse gases are increasing in the atmosphere because people are burning a lot of fossil fuels. We burn fossil fuels for our heating, we burn them for the generation of electric power, we burn them in our cars so that we can go places, we burn them in jet engines when we fly around. All of these uh, uh, activities burn fossil fuels and they increase the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And that's an issue because uh, greenhouse gases have increased quite a bit since the Industrial Revolution and even over the course of the 20th century and it's expected that unless we do something to stop that from happening the greenhouse gases are going to keep on increasing uh, throughout the rest of this century and one thing I want to point out because it's um, it's something that I found when I talk to people um, adults and uh, uh, students and and everyone is that often the public imagines that scientists are now debating whether or not global warming is happening but in fact that's not true. When I talk to scientists, and I spend most of my time talking to scientists, scientists aren't debating whether or not global warming is happening. What they're debating is 
how much global warming is happening, how quickly is it going to happen, how is it going to uh, change our climate, what's going to be the impact on um, how much it rains and how cloudy it is, and all sorts of things like that. But the basic fact that greenhouse warming is happening is, 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 is well known in the scientific community. Thank you. So talking about that, the impacts it has, Cecilia, your focus is sea ice, and so we'd love to hear a little bit more about sea ice, but then also, can you speak to that impact of global warming and climate change on sea ice? Sure, Kyle. Well, you've been looking out the webcam here and seeing the bay just outside our window. That's seawater, and sea ice is frozen seawater. You see a little bit on the edge there, and uh, of course it's not terribly thick now, but eventually in the course of the cooling and uh, uh, freezing of the sea ice, it will reach a thickness that's about as thick as you are tall, and uh, uh, then maybe a little bit more by the end of winter. It's uh, not the same as an iceberg. An iceberg is uh, frozen uh, ice on land that spills off of a glacier into the ocean. You can take a ship through sea ice, but not through uh, an iceberg. In fact, icebergs are very dangerous for ships. Uh, the sea ice covers the Arctic Ocean and Hudson Bay in the uh, maximum extent during winter. That's about one and six tenths the size of the United States at its maximum. It uh, then in springtime will warm up in the air because of the sunlight and it starts to melt. We call that melt onset. And at that point the sea ice starts to thin and its area shrinks back until eventually it's about six tenths the size of the United States. Well a warming climate causes that melt onset to occur a little bit earlier and it also pushes back the time when the ice starts to freeze like we see today. In past years, uh, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, the bay would have already been uh, much more frozen by now, but you can see it's just beginning. That freeze update is occurring later and melt onset is occurring uh, earlier. And so the consequence is that we have a longer melt season and the ice is shrinking back ever more. So uh, each year, the last 30 years, when we can very well visualize the sea ice, we've seen uh, the sea ice shrinking back on average. So that now it's about one third of the area that it used to be at the end of summer. So it sounded like I, I heard a couple different math problems in there, but was it one and six tenths to six tenths? Was that That's right? right? All right, so we can calculate the difference. The mm -hmm. students out there, we'd love to see who can get us the answer in the chat window there as quick as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Homework problem. That's right. <laughs> So um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, John, a little bit about polar bears and that impact and being that they're waiting for the sea ice to come in, mm -hmm. um, just what that means for bears. Mm -hmm. So really the reason that we're here in Hudson Bay and the reason we came out onto the, onto the tundra is because right now this is where a lot of bears are hanging out. They're waiting for that sea ice to come back in because as you remember, as we talked about at the beginning, the most important thing about polar bears is that they eat seals. And the only way that they can catch seals is by getting out onto the sea ice because the seals use the sea ice as well. They come up onto the surface of it to breathe, they come up on the surface of it to rest, and they even come up on the surface of it to give birth to their young. And so that's when polar bears can catch those seals. Seals are very fast swimmers, they're very agile swimmers, and so uh, if a polar bear were to try and swim after them, it probably couldn't catch them in open water. Polar bears are also are not very good at trying to catch fish. And when they're here on land, there just really isn't very much food for them to eat on land. So polar bears really need that sea ice in order to be able to catch seals. And so that's why we're here. And that's also why it's a big problem, as Cecilia was talking about, if we're losing some of that sea ice. If there's not enough, if there's less sea ice than there was in the past, then polar bears aren't going to be able to catch as many seals as they have in the past as well. Okay, so... Knowing that it's a problem, I think we all can agree that there's still something that we can do, right? So I'd love to hear, and maybe Eric, we could start on that end and work our way back, but I'd love to hear what suggestions you have for the students out there. How can they take action? How can they help out? Um, we know that not everyone can perhaps come visit and see the effects, but luckily because of the, the cameras that we're showing and the webcasts like today, we can uh, spread awareness. But what else can they do? Well, we know that global warming is caused by an increase in the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. We know that 
the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are increasing because of the burning of fossil fuels to allow human activities. And so there's two things that you could conceivably do to help. One would be to burn less fossil fuels, and the other would be, well, let me say it another way. You have to reduce the, the, the burning of fossil fuels. There's two ways to do that. One is to find alternative sources of fuel. The other is to make sure that the fossil fuel that we do use is used as efficiently and as effectively as we possibly can use it. So what that means is try to waste as little uh, energy as you can. So as a student so. in a classroom, what suggestions might they make to, I don't know, their parents or themselves as they go to school? How could they reduce energy? Well, if you think about it, a lot of the energy that's used isn't used uh, purposefully. For instance, if I go out of my room and I forget to turn the light off, then the light is always on, even though there's nobody in the room to use that light for anything. So something as simple as turning the light off when you leave the room is a good example. Um, making sure that you close the door when you leave the house, you know, close the refrigerator door. I mean, I'm sure your parents are always <laughs> telling you that, you know. When you leave the refrigerator door open, then you're basically running the refrigerator to cool the food when you should just have the door closed so it stays cold. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Cecilia? Well, I think uh, there are some things you can also consider doing that are alternatives uh, to using energy at all, like walking to school or riding your bike. Um, and also remember that everything we buy from the store is manufactured and that takes energy so if we reuse things and um, take our uh, friends used items that they don't want anymore and also recycling those are all really easy and um, effective ways to help the polar bear and John before you give us that uh, yeah. your, your solution yeah. I just want to remind all the classroom teachers out there we're getting it very close to the question segment so if you mm -hmm. haven't asked your questions send them into questions at pbears.org or else post them right into the chat window and we will be getting to those in just a minute so mm -hmm. back to you sure thing well i think the other panelists really said it well what it comes down to is reduce reuse recycle and it might sound a little bit um silly and it may be, may sound like something you've heard before but it really is important because the thing is, each person doesn't necessarily have to do something really big and dramatic, but if each person does a little thing, and then you have everybody doing that together at the same time, then it's going to make a really big difference. So things that um, you know will uh, save you and your family a little bit of money and be a little bit more efficient with the energy that you are already using, and then looking for ways to reduce the amount of energy that you use, that together, uh, a whole lot of people at once can make a difference. Great, and I think I would also remind the viewers and the students out there that you're most likely viewing this on the My Planet My Part website uh, that Thunder Connections has, and so there are things on there like the No Idling Toolkit that you can uh, go ahead and, and use in setting up No Idle uh, Zones at your schools. There are lots of other resources on there as well, so um, browse around there when we finish the webcast. But now's the time to get into some more of these questions, and we have a lot of them coming in uh, from all, all across the U.S. and Canada. So um, here's an interesting one about ice, Cecilia. How long, I think you might have gotten into this a little, but can you tell, talk to us about how long does it take ice to form? Well, if it's cold out, <laughs> the air temperature below freezing and the seawater just at the freezing point, it will grow immediately and uh, it can grow a couple of centimeters, so an inch at its maximum a day. And then it, once it becomes thicker though, it actually slows down the growth rate. Um, because the ice is like a pretty good insulator, does that, you know that word? It's like wearing an ice coat for the ocean so it doesn't lose heat as fast, so that slows down the growth. Okay, thank you very much. Um, getting into the conservation uh, piece a little bit here, uh, Eric, I'm wondering if you can just help reinforce that connection. We have a student here who's asking, how does turning off the lights and saving energy actually help polar bears? Because it might seem kind of very, like they're very separate. Can you make that direct connection for us? Well, I can try. Um, one of the things that you don't think about uh, in your daily life is where stuff comes from. You know, it's true of almost everything. I go to the store and I buy some. I buy some some food. I don't really know much about how that food get got to the store to begin with. When I turn on the light switch, I use electricity. I don't really think about where did that electricity come from. How did it get to the wall plug where I'm using it? How did it get to that light bulb? And so the interesting exercise is to trace back 
You see a wire coming into your house, perhaps. That's the power line. Where does the power line come from? It comes from a substation in your neighborhood. Where does that get its power from? Well, the power is transmitted ultimately from a power generation station. And then you can ask, how does that power generation happen? It happens usually because something is burned in order to produce heat that's converted into electricity. And so when you use more electricity at your house, they have to burn more stuff at the power plant to, produce, to generate more electricity so that we in our houses can run more things. And so if you use less electricity in your house, then they have to burn less stuff at the power plant, and that means they produce less carbon dioxide, which gets emitted into the atmosphere. So Eric, that actually makes me think of a question. Does every electricity generating, generating station run off of fossil fuels, or is it possible to create electricity from other sources? Well, that's a good question. Um, you can generate electricity in a lot of different ways. Uh, and one of the things that uh, people are really trying to do um, on a larger scale, I mean beyond what you can do in a school for instance, is generate power in other ways. The most visible alternative source of energy is usually windmills. Mm. Often if you're driving in the countryside you can see a big wind farm and all of those wind turbines that blow in the wind, each one of those has a little electric generator on it and they're all supplying mm -hmm. power to the grid without putting any greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. <laughs> I took that picture <laughs> when, <laughs> when I took one of my classes to a wind farm. We had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, here's another question, interesting, interesting one relating it to bears in the Appalachians. Um, Someone's asking, does the town of Churchill experience increasing numbers of polar bears searching for food? Because they're saying that they're getting, maybe not polar bears in the Appalachians, mm -hmm. but bears searching for food. Oh, certainly. That's a great question. And I think it, it brings up the point that um, although polar bears and brown bears and other, other species of bears are all very different in a lot of ways, in some ways they're the, they're the same. They're all fairly large animals and they all need a lot of food. And if they're around human settlements, if they're around towns or houses out in the country, they can probably smell the food that we have in our kitchens and that we have in our refrigerators, and uh, they'd like to take a bite out of it. And so they will come into places with humans looking for that food. Um, during times of year when bears are really hungry, uh, they will be more eager to come into places that have humans and try to get some of that food. So in the Appalachians, I would guess that you might have even more bears than normal coming into towns, maybe during this time of year, when those bears are trying to eat as much as possible to put on stored fat, which they can then live off of during hibernation. So you might not see them as much in your town during summer, but you could sure see them a lot in autumn. And it's kind of the same way with polar bears. Right now, uh, you know, as you've been able to see on some of those shots from outside, it's cold outside, but the water isn't frozen yet. So we don't have sea ice back in this area yet, which means that the bears can't be out hunting seals. So until the bears can get back out and start hunting seals, they're going to do things like possibly go into the town of Churchill and look for food. And some students are asking, so when we're working with polar bears like we're doing this week, is it dangerous? And, and I would say we probably all have different ways to, to answer this question, but, um, but absolutely it can be dangerous. Of course, if they're looking for, for food, then yep. they might mistake us as food. And so that's why we're in these tundra buggies again, and that we're able to be way up high and stay away from them. In fact, um, earlier I was, I was writing something this week about not stepping on the ground for five days, because really that's what we've been asked to do. Uh, as we've been out on the tundra here, we haven't touched the ground for, for several days because we don't want to go down there where the polar bears are because we definitely don't want to be mistaken. Uh, yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit more about your work as you've spent time even in Alaska mm -hmm. working with bears and uh, the dangerous elements involved? Sure thing. Well, the first thing I would say is that if my mom is watching, <laughs> I would say, no, it's not dangerous. I'm fine. <laughs> okay, now that I've said that, um, it is a little bit dangerous. Uh, you have to be really careful up here, and it's not just the bears. It's actually the fact that we're in a really remote place that's really far from big cities, really far from hospitals. Um, if anything uh, bad were to happen out here, it's just very difficult to get help. Um, it's also very cold, and there's also a lot. There's so much water around, and we're often working near the coast that you have to be careful about not falling into the water. Um, you know, one of the things that I've done is spend a lot of time flying around in helicopters. And in that case, uh, we hire experienced pilots and experienced mechanics. And we have to rely a lot on the judgment of other experts, people who do things like fly the helicopters, in order to keep us safe. As far as the bears go, 
you know, one big thing is just staying out of their way. So like Kyle was mentioning, today we're in these buggies that are all, I think the windows are at 12 feet, is that right? Mm -hmm. 12 feet, so. maybe about three or four meters above the ground. And so even a really big bear is going to stand up and then reach and not really be able to reach the windows. So we're just out of reach of the bears so we can look at them but not get too close. And the other important thing actually I would add right away off the bat is working with any wildlife species, the most important thing up here is that you never feed a bear. Because once a bear actually gets a hold of food and it's around a human, it may think that, well, if I go near humans, I can get food. So as long as the bears aren't fed, then they aren't as dangerous. Interesting. Um, I think this question, so you might be able to answer this one a little bit for us as well. Are there different kinds of seals and what other mm -hmm. animals, uh, you know, are there, is, what's the most common animal in the Arctic? You deal with sea ice a lot. I have to imagine that means you deal with the animals on the sea ice. On the sea ice, the probably greatest mass of animals is seals, uh, but it's a, not very well known because seals aren't as easy to see. They spend most of their time under the sea ice, and then they only uh, haul out periodically to, uh, well, one, to have their young. They have to have their pups on top of the sea ice. The ringed seals actually build these really neat snow caves, so when the snow depths are um, deep enough in springtime, they uh, dig a little cave inside and they have their young. Uh, so I think your question though was uh, more more than that. Remind me again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's part of it. Yeah. Basically, what other marine life is out there? Oh, right. What and how? What <clears throat> other kinds of seals are there? So I mentioned ring seals. There's bearded seals that are also uh, on top of the sea ice. And uh, then there are other kinds of seals that don't use the sea ice but are in this vicinity. Uh, help me with that. Um. There are, uh, here in Hudson Bay, I know another one of the species that we have um, in this part of the Arctic that isn't necessarily in the other parts of the Arctic are called harbor seals. Um, let's see, I think we said ringed and bearded. Um, and here's one question for you. I just want to make sure. Are there penguins in the Arctic? Are there? No. No, definitely no not. Penguins. So. <laughs> it would be a massacre. The bears would have them in an instant. They certainly <laughs> would. They certainly right. would. There are walruses, though, here, too. Mm -hmm. uh, more in the higher Arctic than in this southern uh, location. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of whale species as well. They obviously don't use the sea ice surface, but sometimes when you're flying over the coastline, which I've done a lot, um, you can look down and see different whale species. I've seen beluga whales, which aren't very big, but they're bright white, so they're pretty easy to see. And then there are also bowhead whales, which are really big. Bowhead whales are one of the biggest whale species out there. And there you're seeing an image of a beluga, which is pretty darn cool. Some other interesting questions coming in. Um, we talked a little bit about adaptations, and there's some questions about um, what adaptations polar bears have, but I think it brings up an interesting point and another question here, mm -hmm. which is, what did polar bears evolutionize from, mm -hmm. um, from what other type of bear? Sure, so polar bears, it's thought that polar bears diverged from brown bears, which again are also called grizzly bears, about 600,000 years ago. So what that means is that there was a group of, po uh, group of brown bears around 600,000 years ago that started uh, utilizing the sea ice habitat. And over time, some of those bears that happened to have a lighter coat color, for example, were more successful, probably more successful at sneaking up on seals, more successful at living longer and at reproducing young. And that created a natural selection pressure which drove the evolution of polar bears. So it, it, in the long run, over many generations, it meant that the bears that looked white and were bigger and had bigger canine teeth were more successful. And so that's how we got the polar bears that we know of today. Interesting. So talking about adaptations, there's another question about, you know, someone told us that bears run better uphill uh, than downhill because of their legs and that mm. type of a, um, of a change of their the way they're made because of their environment. Can you talk right. to that? I have to be honest, it's pretty flat up here, so <laughs> I've never seen a polar bear run uphill or downhill. <laughs> I've only seen them run on level ground. That's a great question though, and I don't know. Their morphology certainly will be affected by the kind of habitat they're running in. Polar bears do spend most of their time on the sea ice, but they do also swim a lot. And when they're swimming, um, what's really interesting is that they have these huge feet and they use those front feet as paddles or as oars. So they do a dog paddle. They take that great big paw, and then just like you'd expect from your dog in the water, they're using it to kind of make this motion with their front paws, and they're pulling, them, pulling themselves forward through the water. However, they don't really use their back paws. The back paws just kind of trail out behind them, so they're doing like a half dog paddle. 
Great. And can we clarify a little bit? Because I think we were using a whole lot of terms there. And mm -hmm. evolutionize. What, can you talk to us a little bit about what does that even mean, evolutionize? Sure. So the process of evolution is how we end up with a lot of different species. So, for example, in the case of brown bears and polar bears, you'll have a group of brown bears. Say you have 10 different brown bears. And just like people have blonde hair and brown hair and all different kinds of color of hair, you can have a group of brown bears that have all different colors. So even though the name is brown bear, you might have some bears that are lighter in color than others. Now, if you put those 10 brown bears out on the sea ice, the ones that are really brown are going to stick out against the white background and they probably won't be able to sneak up on seals as well so they probably won't be able to catch as many seals which means they won't be as healthy they won't live as long and they may not have as many babies now if you have a brown bear that's a really light color it's going to be more successful at catching seals um, so it's going to eat more it's going to be bigger and it's probably going to have more babies now it's going to pass on its genes and genes are just the things that make, for example, you look like your parents. So if you happen to have very tall parents, you might end up being a very tall kid yourself. If you had very short parents, you might very end up being a very short kid yourself. So the baby of a very light colored brown bear is probably going to be light as well. And the other brown bears, which were very dark in color, they won't have as many babies. And so if that happens generation after generation after generation, you end up with a whole population of bears that's very white in color. And that takes a really long time. So it's not a process that you can watch going on on the sea ice at once because it takes very many generations. So we're talking about not something that happens over a year or two, but we're talking about something that happens over thousands of years. Interesting. So we've got a lot of questions coming in about um, this impact of, of a warming world and, and w what it's doing to polar bears. And so some of the questions that I'm wondering if you can answer are things like, do polar bears migrate? Um, if they do travel, how far do they travel? When are you seeing changes in when they're traveling because of this warming and so forth? Mm -hmm. I know I have some thoughts on that. Eric, do you want to say anything about when polar bears, for example, come through this area and why they come through at this point? Well, my understanding of that is that uh, the polar bears come here because there is no ice for them to be on. That's where they would prefer to be. Uh, and I believe it's also the fact that this is the last place in Hudson Bay where the ice persists through the summer. So if you're a bear and you want to be on the ice and the ice is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, then as that ice recedes towards the western side of the bay, that's where all the, bays, the bears end up being. And so. Uh, one of the things that's really amazing if you spend a few days here is just how many polar bears there are. You know, when you think of these bears and they, they, they go all over Hudson Bay, they're, they have this range of a half a million square miles, and yet uh, when there's no ice, they're all concentrated here. That's why this is a great place to come to look at polar bears. So when you say, in general, when you say polar bear migration, Really what that refers to is during the summer when a lot of the ice melts, polar bears either everybody has to move to shore because all the ice is gone, or in some places in the Arctic, the ice just moves really far north. So all the polar bears may instead move really far north. So those are the two big movements that a polar bear would do. Okay, thank you. Um, can you talk to us a little bit? Lots of questions for you, John, yep. being the expert. Um, yeah. How big is a polar bear's brain? How thick is its fur? Can you talk a little bit about the numbers or stats of the polar bear? Oh, that's a great question. How big is a polar bear's brain? You know, they're really smart, so I would say it's pretty darn big. <laughs> <laughs> are they but smarter than the average bear? I think they are smarter than the average bear. <laughs> and you're seeing some great pictures of them right there. They are really big animals. Um, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head how much their brain actually weighs or what kind of volume it occupies. Um, as I said before, the biggest polar bears we think max out at about 800 kilograms, which is going to be around 1,800 pounds. When they stand up on their hind legs, they're going to be around 10 to 12 meters tall. So as you're seeing in that picture, when they come up and start pushing each other back and forth, those guys are standing anywhere from 8, 9, 10 feet, maybe even a little bit higher above the ground. So if they wanted to, and if they were into playing basketball, they could probably dunk. Um, in terms of their fur, we do have a little bit of a sample of polar bear fur here right now 
and their fur is going to change during the course of the year. So during the spring and in early summer when the temperatures are getting much warmer, they're going to lose a lot of their fur. Just like a dog, uh, a pet dog would, they're going to go through a molt and they're going to, uh, their fur is going to become a little bit thinner so they don't overheat during the summer. Then around this time of year, they're going to gain a lot of that fur back. And they have two kinds of fur on here. They have these coarse long thick uh, guard hairs which are the kind of fur that you really see and then underneath that which is more difficult to see is a very fine thin fur it's kind of like the down of a bird and that helps provide extra insulation thank you very much so let's bring this back full topic because we've been getting a lot of questions also about the th kinds of things that you can do. I'm wondering if one of you can speak to, uh, Chair was asking about, what about voting with your forks? This idea that the food that you, that each person individually chooses to eat can make a difference. Um, and she was mentioning alternatives over meat and dairy products by choosing, you know, fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, things like that. Would any of you be happy to, or, or be willing to speak mm -hmm. on that? I can do that. Well, you probably realize that animals eat vegetables for the most part, or there are some, of course, that are carnivores, but the kind of animals that we usually eat are uh, veg vegetarians, like cows and chickens. And they have to eat, you know, 10 or so times their body weight over their lifetime. Uh, so their efficiency is not very high compared to if you just simply ate that weight or, or number of calories in, in the vegetables yourself. So you're um, you're sort of losing a big factor of efficiency when you eat an animal that eats vegetables. I mean, I'm, I'm not advocating, they you know, telling you you should do one or the other, but exclu exclusively, but reducing the amount of meat and fish, it turns out, that you eat does um, if improve your efficiency because, of course, uh, plants require uh, human energy and uh, resources when we harvest them and then transport them to the market. So those are all uh, things that cost us energy and uh, that means that they have a greenhouse gas impact. So people have estimated that if you change your diet 100% from meat to 100% um, vegetables, you are almost equal to reducing uh, your impact from driving a very large car like a SUV, a sport utility vehicle, to a, a compact car. So it's a pretty large uh, influence that you can make by just shifting a, towards a more vegetarian-based diet. Great, thank mm -hmm. you very much. And we do have way more questions that we could ever get to, but we thank you so much for sending those in, and we will be doing our best to, to respond to your questions um, through email and so forth. But we can't thank you enough for joining us today. We do want you to know that we absolutely think that there are things that you can do, from taking a shorter shower to turning off the lights and perhaps changing your diet, that there are ways uh, that you can have an impact and that you can uh, help to save this this arctic environment so if you're looking for other things to do we definitely want to encourage you to explore the my planet my part website which is most likely where you're viewing this webcast from because the launch of this website includes a contest and that contest is open from now until november 26th and one of the really cool things about the contest is that you can win the opportunity, the chance to come right up here uh, to Churchill and perhaps sit where we are right now so that you can go and see the polar bears in their native habitat. So that's pretty neat and we definitely want to encourage you to take a look there. And other things you can do, you can upload your own resources and share what you're doing in your classrooms. So um, share pictures audio, um, videos perhaps, of what are the things you've done around your school, around your classroom, perhaps around your house uh, to make a difference and, and, help, uh, and help us out. Additionally, if you have not signed up for the Project Polar Bear uh, promotion, we have extended that until November 6th. So you can go ahead and join a team, form a team, join together to create a project that reduces greenhouse gas emissions. And the registration has been extended till November 6th, so we definitely want to encourage you to do so. And of course, we want you to, to check out the Tundra Connections webpage where there will be a post webcast survey. We want to know all about how your experience was today on this webcast, what questions, what comments you might have so that we can make this better. And participants will be entered to, to win a drawing uh, for a free polar bear adoption. So they're kind of cool. Our, 
heartfelt thanks goes out to Julene Reed, an Apple Distinguished Educator, and, and one of the people that may, that sits on the Polar Bears International Educational Advisory, and she really makes things happen and helps run the Tundra Connections program. So Julene, if you're out there, thank you so much for everything that you do. And of course, our platinum sponsor, Frontiers North. Uh, Tundra Buggy Adventures, the reason that we can sit here and, and broadcast from the tundra, from the shores of the Hudson Bay is because we can be on these phenomenal, phenomenal vehicles. So thank you so much to Frontiers North. And support's also been provided by Planet of the Pearls, a project of explore.org, and a, chari a direct charitable activity of the Annenberg Foundation. Finally, we're grateful to Parks Canada and Tanberg, now a part of Cisco Systems. And overall, I think the whole panel will agree with me in saying thanks to you. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your incredibly busy days to join us, to learn with us. There are so many ways that you can extend this experience within your own classrooms, from books to read and movies to watch and learnings from your own classroom teacher. So thank you for taking time out of your day and thanks to each of the panelists for, for joining me in what I hope was a fun and educational experience. <laughs> Yep. Thank you. All right. Definitely make a difference, guys. Thanks, Thanks for watching. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye -bye. Take care. Too late to save the bears. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>